Hello hackers! Uh, welcome to uh, another video on Pwn College. Uh, this one is on privilege escalation. All right, let's introduce privilege escalation and dive in and then send you along to uh, try your hand at the practice problems. All right, so recall the Linux permission model. And I say recall because I assume in this module and in this course that you have an understanding of the Linux permission model already from a user's perspective. Um, if you don't, if there's enough demand, we might create a fundamentals video about the Linux permission model, but here I'm just gonna talk about it at a very high level, right? In Linux, hopefully this is review, every um, process has a user ID and a group ID. So here uh, as a screenshot of my terminal, I ran the ID command ID, um, printed out its uh, user ID, which is 1000, of course, to the kernel, they're all numbers, but um, these numeric user IDs have um, names associated with them so that they're more approachable by humans. Um, and uh, I have a group ID of also 1000. These are the default uh, primary user IDs on Ubuntu. Um, all right, we won't talk about the secondary groups I have. Uh, we might dig into that in a later time. Um, but essentially, uh, every user has a user ID and a group ID. And every file and every directory in Linux is owned by a user and a group. So here I look at bincat and I see that bincat is owned by root and has a group uh, owner of root as well. Um, so the root group and the root user. And on the left, you see its permissions. And the relevant thing here is RWX and then Rx and then Rx or uh, R dash X and R dash X. And what this means, uh, the first RWX is for the user. So the root user, that's who owns it, can read, write and execute this file. The root group can read and, ex read and execute this file. So any process that is in the root group. Um, and I said process, not user, because it's the process on which uh, these permissions are checked. But of course, when you create a process or when you create your initial session as a user, your initial process and here's these, um, it receives these permissions uh, as it's set up. Um, and then anyone not in the root group, the rest of the world can also read and execute. All right. Um, I mentioned, keep mentioning, you know, permissions uh, or uh, these credentials exist on the process level. Um, child processes inherit them from their parent, generally speaking. There are exotic situations that are different, but generally speaking, the parent will set up some, um, and actually one of the exotic situations we're going to right now, but generally speaking, the uh, parent runs the child and the child, you know, if you recall from the fundamental series on Linux process loading, when the parent forks, the child will inherit uh, everything that the parent has uh, in terms of credentials. Um, there are exceptions. Uh, all right, so here I have on my terminal, uh, again, a screenshot. I created a get UID uh, program that just calls get UID. It is a system call that, um, well, this is a C function that eventually calls a system call that gets me my user ID. Um, I uh, executed it and of course here I still have my you know 1000 uh, user and then I run it and it also says 1000. All right, um, there are user IDs other than 1000. One very specific one is zero. On um, Linux and other Unix-like systems, user ID zero is special. That is root, it's the system administrator user. Um, it's used for, you need to be root for uh, making large system changes, installing software in most configurations, um, system-wide at least, loading device drivers, changing the system state uh, and settings and so forth. And so if, if you are user ID 1000 or 1001 or whatever other one, how do you become user ID zero? Well, let's dig in. So you become user ID zero by elevating your privileges by using, for example, a set UID binary. The most famous example of this, the most common one nowadays is sudo, right? So there's a 
popular XKCD uh, comic about it on the top right there. You try to run a command. You don't have the permissions. You sudo that command. And then you have the permissions. The most common uh, thing that you probably sudo for is apt to install software. Um, back uh, when I first started using Linux, uh, we didn't really use sudo. Most people used su. Very similar sort of uh, conceptual functionality, that, at least to what most people use sudo for. Um, basically, uh, yeah, very similar, just required the root user to have its own password. All right, how does sudo and su and uh, things like new group, which actually allows you to swap into one of those secondary groups that you saw on my profile, on my uh, user ID and so forth, how does this work? Well, they work using um, an additional bits in the Linux permission model, that, of, of the, that, that file uh, permission model that we didn't talk about. Right, we talked about the user read write execute, the group read write execute, and the world read write execute. But there are three more bits that we haven't discussed. The most important of these is the set UID bit followed by the set GID bit. If these bits are set, then um, the uh, effective, uh, uh, hold on, I need to fix one thing. All right, I'm not sure why that didn't update, but it is there now. So um, when you run a file, when you execute a file and it has the set UID bit set, the process executes with an effective user ID, and we'll talk about what this means, of um, the uh, uh, um, file owner rather than the parent process. Same with the group ID. If you have the uh, uh, set group ID bit set and you execute a file, then the resulting process will have the group ID of the file rather than of the, uh, of the parent process. Um, there's that third bit, the sticky bit, that's you know the, the world equivalent of the user and group. It's completely different, it's used on directories. If you have a um, shared directory that's writable by multiple users, then the sticky bit will ensure that a user can only remove files that they have added. They can't remove other people's files. Completely separate, um, but also part of this permission model. Usually used for temp directories or, or you know, homework turn-in directories or something along these lines. All right, um, I mentioned the effective user ID. So what is the effective user ID? It turns out that I simplified things in the first slide. So every um, process has actually three types of user and group IDs, effective, real, and saved. The effective user ID is what is um, uh, used, for lack of a better, different term, less uh, colliding term. Uh, the effective user ID is used for access control checks. So when you try to open a file, it checks, okay, what is your effective ID? Um, the real ID is basically the, the, the true identity of the process. Um, uh, for example, if you are trying to send signals to a process, that is what uh, will be checked. Um, the saved uh, ID is used for if you are a privileged process and you want to perform some action unprivileged for extra safety, you can save your privileged user ID assume an effective and real ID of an unprivileged process and then restore from your saved user ID uh, when you're done needing to lower your privileges. Um, this usually actually uh, leads to security vulnerabilities. Um, if you're unprivileged, whatever you're doing in an unprivileged way gets access to that saved user ID. And um, because this is how the system works, the whole point of that saved user ID is to be able to reset your effective user ID then they can re-elevate their privileges. This isn't quite as important. I probably went way deeper into it than necessary. The point is that effective user ID. And um, what happens when you um, uh, have a set UID bit is it sets that effective uh, user ID. So let's take a look. All right. So. I have my get UID.C. I also have a get GID.C. 
wrong uh, cat. Okay, cool. Let's uh, compile them. Turn off warnings because I didn't uh, add any include, so these are smaller for the slides. UID, GID, awesome. So let's run get UID. It says user 1000, uh, get GID, group 1000. Of course, that's my user in my group. Let's take a look at GID and UID. They are readable, writable, executable by user Jans, readable, writable, and executable by user Jans, and readable and executable by, or sorry, the second one was group Jans, and readable and executable by not group Jans, anyone that, that is not user Jans or group Jans. So other users on the system, I hope there are no other users on the system, because that would be a surprise to me. All right. Um, so let's uh, add the set UID bit. Um, we're gonna use these sort of uh, semantic meanings. You should also know what um, this means, um, but right now this will um, add the set UID bit to the user part of this, right? So get UID, awesome. Let's run get UID, or let's take a look. All right, so now this is a special binary. It will uh, run, I still have execute permissions to it, you have to take my word for it, I didn't remove them. All this says is to the user permissions, add the set UID, set UID is kind of, of course, useless without um, 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 executable permissions because you have to execute the file. But um, so I have a read, write, and execute with the set UID as user, still read, write, and execute as group, read, execute as the world. And if I execute it, will I be root? No. There are two reasons. We'll get into the second one later. The first one is that um, the owner is Jans. So the... Uh, ID that I'm assuming I, that, that I'm becoming the effective user ID is Jan's. This, the second one, so let's actually fix that first one. Um, let's make this owned by root. Now let's take a look. One thing you'll notice that happened is the set UID bit is gone. Um, this is a security precaution when you change, you, or at least when you use chown. I'm not sure if you use the chown syscall, this will happen. When you use chown to change ownership of a um, file, the uh, it'll also reset the set UID bit. Um, all right, so let's set it back over there. All right, cool. Um, now we have a file owned by root that has set UID in the user spot. So if I run this, I should be root, right? Wrong. Why? Well, it's very simple. Get UID, this function I'm using, it gets the real user ID. You do get EUID, that'll get me the um, effective user ID, and then we'll be good to go. So I compile it. Okay, here it is again, owned by me. Uh, let's uh, ch own it. Awesome, ch mod it. Let's take a look. Okay, run get UID. Effective user ID zero. What about my effective group ID? So um, rather than uh, spend time showing you that it's the real, okay. Let's just look straight at the effective one. So here is get GID. We're gonna ch own. Up, there we go. Operation not permitted. Sudo, boom. Okay. Um, ch mod GID. Now I ch modded it user state, uh, set UID or set UID, which is the, um, the user. 
so what will this run as group wise well group wise the effective group id should still be 1000 because there's nothing that will change it the set gid isn't there yep so what if we um set the group gid let's take a look now it's set very cool run it zero okay awesome i've shown you that has shown to you that that uh, said you or uh, said UID and said GID work. Um, one thing, by the way, um, let's uh, just uh, that was an easy way to reset them. Get you uh, yeah, to get UID and GID. Cool, it's all reset. Now I'm going to do sudo. That's how I get GID. One thing that to keep in mind, sudo will, will start a new session as whatever user you're sudoing to, usually root, um, and it'll properly set the effects of real saved everything you need, uh, generally speaking, unless there are bugs, which happen. All right, um, let's roll on. So, you can become user ID zero but with great power comes great responsibility um root is extremely powerful aside from like you know making changes on your system you can uh open any file or remove any file or, or actually vi violate file permissions altogether we'll talk later about why this occurs um this includes the special slash proc file system so as root you can for example read the memory of any process uh, because there's a special file in uh, the, the memory so you can do proc self mem this is a special file that you can open and read out the memory contents and virtual memory of this file that's you know pretty serious thing it can also by the way write these memory contents so a uh, content so root can already do basically anything um, oops let me jump to the terminal to show you. Here is that file. There's the memory of your your content. Pretty bad news for the memory of your process. Um, and actually, if you look at slash proc, this is all of the different processes running on my system, and root could grab the memory of any of them. All right. Uh, there are things you can do to change this configuration, but we're talking about most cases, common cases. Um, root can execute any program assume any other user group id debug any program attached to programs with debuggers etc uh, again in in normally there are ways to to change this uh, uh, but obviously in the normal case this is a security disaster right you you really don't want anyone to um that is not supposed to be uh root to be root um but people uh try to become root all the time uh, this step of an exploit or, or class of vulnerability is um, called a privilege escalation. Right? In a privilege escalation uh, exploit, an attacker generally, after gaining a foothold on the system, whether through a vulnerable network service or, or maybe uh, they have intended shell access, so for example in a uh, class auto grading system, or maybe the attacker can control some code in an app on your device, but, but the app is running in a very, uh, or on your phone, for example, right? It's running in a very constrained environment. Um, the next step is usually to identify some sort of vulnerable privileged process on that uh, device or on the shared homework grading server or wherever you are, exploit that to gain its privileges, right? Um, a good, a common attack surface for this is a set UID binary, right? So if there's something uh, running with as a set UID or set GID or something, and it is vulnerable, very frequently happens for coarse grading systems. Um, attackers can use it, uh, uh, exploit it to gain its privileges, right? It's kind of like a Highlander thing. Two programs will fight and, and, and there can only be one. Um, Probably that's a very outdated reference. Anyways, let's move on. Um, 
So would anyone be careless enough to have vulnerable set UID programs like in Android? Well, it turns out absolutely. I mean, we just talking about sudo installed everywhere, set UID everywhere. If you go back every single year until I got bored Googling back in time, sudo has had serious uh, critical vulnerabilities that would allow attackers to uh, um, acquire elevated privileges in many different configurations and, and uh, use cases, um, which is uh, very scary because sudo is everywhere, right? So if sudo is vulnerable, it's very likely that other uh, less common set UID programs and thus less you know looked at are vulnerable as well. Uh, I mean, another, um, we mentioned the course auto grading system. Um, another uh, large attack surface is programs that are unnecessarily uh, either sudoed or, or set UID'd is what I meant to type on the slide or run as root by, by some other means, um, right? Uh, this is very common, like I said, in course grading systems and, and, and uh, shared server management software. When I was in industry, I, I saw this quite a lot. Um, it is also uh, increasingly becoming common with the rise of uh, containerization and Docker. There's a lot of uh, Docker containers that unnecessarily run everything as root because they can and it's easier. Uh, this opens up some level of attack surface even though a Docker container is generally uh, contained. Uh, but it is some additional access that is not strictly necessary for an attacker to be able to acquire. Um, another very common way to uh, uh, do privilege escalation is um, through OS level kernel level vulnerabilities. Uh, we'll be talking about this in a several months, so stay tuned on that. All right, so this brings us to the end of this introductory video for this module, um, and we'll talk about the practice problems, and I'll actually do a few um, live. So this module has uh, several, specifically 100 practice problems, or rather you have to solve 100 practice problems to get full uh, points. Generally speaking, we're going to connect to Pwn College. We're going to select um, one of the 100 instances of practice problem. Each one will let us input a program path of like a Unix or uh, Linux utility. That utility will just be granted set UID access or the set UID bit will be uh, checked. And you have to use that utility to read slash flag, which is only readable by root. So you have to use that to either escalate your privileges or, or, or just read the file. All right, we're gonna demo three. Um, these are free solutions for you if you want to use them. If you don't want to use them and want a bigger challenge, don't use them, do something else. Um, let me show you. So let's start. All right. Um, Okay. Awesome. Um, here is uh, the the website, the the front page of Pwn College. If you refresh it, what's going on? Hold on, my computer's having issues. Okay, issue solved. Um, all right. If you click through uh, module one, so here is the module. Here's a link to our, this video. These are fundamentals that you might want to know. Um, if we end up creating uh, fundamentals of uh, Linux process from permissions or the Linux permission model, I'll add that there. Um, and uh, some descriptions involving other free solutions if you're interested. So let's click through to get to the challenges. I'm already logged in. You go to the challenges. Here is the are the 100 instances. So you click on instance one. I've already solved cat, but I'm just going to show you how to do it. Here we do bin cat, run it. I was, oh, I put a space. Make sure that you have the path correct. Run it. All right, so it tells me I can connect. I can, of course, SH in, but I'm going to use the terminal on the web page. It's, it's easier. Um, 
I can see that bin cat was is now set UID root. I can look at slash flag, which is only read by root, but it's nice and easy because I can cat it out. And here's the flag. This is my flag. Don't submit my flag. Everyone gets their own flag. Get your own flag. All right. So that was nice and easy. Let's um, so I can of course copy this flag. Uh, copy. I can go back to the challenges. Paste the flag. Nope. That's the paste the flag. Submit. And I already solved cat, so it's not going to let me do it again. All right. So let's do more. So I already solved bin cat. Let's do, uh, is it bin more or user bin more? Let's try both. Yep, it was bin more. Awesome. So you go into the terminal now. See, bin more is uh, said UID root. Our flag is still slash flag. So cat was a program that just, um, you would give it a file on the command line or by default, it just echoed whatever you, you said back to it. Let's just run cat. Yeah, see? Cool. Actually, now let me show you that cat slash flag doesn't work, right? More is similar, but it um, stops and, 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 and it, it's a pager application. It gives you one page at a time. There's no, the flag isn't long enough for that. So we just do more slash flag and we get the flag. Copy that. Go back to challenges. Nice and easy. Okay. Correct. So now... If I pull this up, I see I've solved cat and more. All right, those are, are easy um, programs that are designed to read a file. So there are some programs that aren't designed to read a file that you can trick into reading files. But I wanna show you one more. I wanna show you find. Find isn't designed to read a file. So how would we solve user bin find? Okay, we're live. Let's go to challenges, uh, terminal, sorry. And we look at user bin find, set UID. All right, our flag as always is uh, unreadable. So I can do find slash flag. What does find do? Well, if I look at find dash dash help, um, I mean, this at least shows you the arguments. What find does is, is find files for you, right? You give it a bunch of criteria and it'll find them. The interesting thing is that one of the um, up, um, things that file can do, and this is very important because file is not the only one, is dash exec. So file can execute commands. If you have a system where you have man pages, or if we just go and do man file, find, pull up this man page, and read up on what dash exec does, it executes the command that's given. Um, and the way that you use it, that's pretty unreadable in the text I realized. The way that you use it is you give a dash exec, and then the command, and then this, uh, uh, tilde uh, open back curly braces, which are, if you read this, uh, will be replaced by the file name and then a semicolon, which is where it'll terminate. So let's, uh, this lost connection. All right, we're back. So find dash exec. So we can, could execute something like ID. Let's try it out with a semicolon. I have to escape the semicolon, otherwise it'll terminate the command because we're in bash here. So let's um, do this. Pass my must proceed. Uh, so I was using find incorrectly just now. So find slash flag. Yeah. All right. So here's an interesting thing. Find executed ID. And you can see that I am running as EUID, effective user ID of root. So this is incredible. At this point, we should be done. And of course, we are. So I can do cat and I tell it to the, it give it its curly bra brackets. And here it is. So what just happened? It executed cat slash flag as root with an effective user ID of root. 
So that permission check passed. Can copy this. Can go to the challenges. Can go instance three and flag. All right. You now have three additional uh, three freebies. If you read um, the module on Pwn College, there's a couple more in there. Uh, I think you can get to 100. Good luck.